Well, that's good. So I'm going to start by just introducing my, my colleague and friend, Thomas, um, and myself, Irene. You've probably heard of us before, but if just in case you haven't, I work at Coventry University and I've just, my job's just been confirmed on the 1st of September this year as the Academic in Integrity Lead for the Coventry University Group, which is good. That's the job I've been doing for a little while, but it's nice to have that recognition that that's my job for, for now. Thomas, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, hi everyone, welcome to this conversation. So I'm Thomas Lancaster. I currently work at Imperial College London. I'm a, a teaching fellow in computing which in theory means I know something about computing, although it moves very fast. So I don't feel like I know anywhere near as much as I used to do. And Irene, although she won't always admit this, is also a computer scientist by trade. But um, we're both here because of our passion to do with academic integrity and because of a lot of the work that uh, we've conducted in this area. We, I worked at Coventry for a um, relatively short period of time. We got to know Irene quite well at that time and uh, traveled to various places with her and um, we knew of each other before that though didn't we Irene and yeah. always yeah yeah we knew of each other but it was it was good to work together for a few years because we then got to know more about each other and uh, we had um, we worked on one project um, that was called the CPA project um, that stood for South South European um, Southeast European Southeast policies. I've got the name. Policies for academic integrity. So we actually we we studied along with uh, Thomas Faltinek from uh, from uh, Brno in Czech Republic. We studied some um, uh, the countries that former Yugoslavian countries plus Albania, um, which was a bit of a hairy moment for me when I travelled to, to Albania on my own. But uh, but we had quite a nice trip to. Um, to what is now called uh, North Macedonia. Um, it wasn't called that then, was it? It was the former, former Yugoslavia. Yugoslavian Republic of Macedonia, I think. Yes, but it's now called North Macedonia. So uh, um, a very interesting country. But, but Thomas also tra uh, traveled on his own to uh, Montenegro for that project, didn't you? Which I regret I didn't go with you on that on that trip, but we couldn't, couldn't um, synchronize our diaries so we ended up not being able to do that so. yeah well, fasc fascinating country montenegro yeah i've been there three times pre-covid days for different reasons and to to speak and to collect data and yeah it's a shame you didn't get to go but yeah, uh, but yeah. all the countries we found there was a lot of similarity in that part of the world between the countries yeah and um but the interesting yeah. thing is that since we did that project uh, North Macedonia, uh, not North, sorry, Montenegro has actually moved quite fast in terms of its approach to academic integrity, and um, and it now has uh, a kind of a national approach to academic integrity. Um, so it's, it's although it it came out quite low in terms of the survey that we did, it's it's improving all the time, which which is a good, it kind of shows the power of doing this kind of research because it just highlights for these countries that they need to take action. And they did, and that's, that's, re that's really rewarding. From doing yeah, that. yeah, and quite a, quite a tiny country as well. I, mean, I should, should remember what the population is of Montenegro, but I think it's something like half a million people. So yeah. um, in some ways it makes it easier to do those kind of initiatives when it's a smaller country than a big one because you can bring people with you. Yeah, and, and if I remember the initiatives, one of them was relating to laws surrounding contract cheating there. And actually one of the first countries in a whole block which has brought in a legal approach. And many people will, may know me on this uh, webinar in this discussion that a lot of my research that my career is related to contract cheating and students getting somebody else to do their work for them, which is, clearly not um, not an activity we would like to see in education because we want the student who does the work to be the one we assess and the one who gets the the grade at the end but yeah so we saw this change in Montenegro and uh, I mean oh, legal there been a lot of countries starting to bring in legal um, sort of 
uh, or legal, say legal solutions, if that's the right word, to contract cheating, haven't they? Yes, that's right. And in fact, I, I read your your ICII blog this morning, and uh, one of the countries that you missed on there was uh, was Austria. They they they've actually brought in some legislation. It's very kind of Germanic the way they phrased it, though. It's all it's dictating what the penalties will be. Um, for using using SA mills and things. So that's worth looking at. But I wondered actually, now you've segued onto this topic, what, what if you'd like to share your views on, um, on on the legislation, perhaps talk about the, the English uh, legislation that's just been introduced. It, was, it, it became law in April. You had Queen's consent in April. And then when you've done that, perhaps I'll talk about we're doing what we're doing in our institution about that. Okay, that sounds like a plan. So yes, yeah, so as I already mentioned, I there is a, a new blog post up on the ICAA uh, blog, where I've just shared a few thoughts about uh, laws and policies surrounding academic integrity and contract cheating. By all means, check that one out. The, the posts on the blog, there's lots of them. They often appear quite slowly during that process, or, or quite quietly, that's a better word for this one here. But Certainly, thanks, Mary, for sharing the link as well. Uh, yeah, uh, Irene, as you said, in England, but not the whole of the United Kingdom, uh, a law was brought in earlier this year in April to essentially make the provision of contract cheating services illegal, uh, not necessarily um, being a consumer of those services. So there's no move to make it illegal for a student to use such a service. Although, of course, the student will still be breaching the integrity rules at their own institution for that one, but very much to uh, allow us to have the power to go after the contract treaty providers, so essay mills, even individual writers who are being paid to do the work, and also the power to ban advertising in England by many of these services, because if you've not checked what a student sees on social media these days, if they have registered as part of a university, they will have very targeted advertising, which may well include adverts from firms to do their work for them. I don't tend to see that advertising myself because I'm not registered as a student and my social media uh, means it wouldn't be a, a good use of the advertising budget of these firms, but the budget is out there. And uh, certainly as we're moving into face-to-face -face environments again, physical advertising is appearing as well. Now, so I think law, to answer Irene's question, has um, has a role to play in reducing the visibility of contract cheating provision, in helping us to have a discussion with students to say, you know, the service you're using or your peers are considering using um, is illegal, clearly sends a strong message out to them. But I mean, at the same time, I don't think it is a sole solution to the problem. And I mean, many reasons for that. First of all, we have just in the UK context, we have a law in England. We don't have a law in Scotland, in Wales or in Northern Ireland. So some of the other constituent parts of the UK can still advertise these services to students in England. It'd be very easy for a firm just to move their registered address elsewhere within the UK at the moment to get around these. Uh, at the same time, it'd be very easy for a firm operating outside the UK entirely, as the vast majority of them are, to continue to promote to students in the UK in various ways, or even if they don't directly advertise for the students to seek them out, because there are lots of ways of getting around the laws. There are ways to make yourself look like you're offering uh, tutorial services as opposed to directly offering cheating. But when someone gets in contact with you, you can tell them what the real um, services you're offering. So all kinds of ways around it. And the, the other thing which does stand out to me, and people have emailed me and asked me this question is, when are we going to see a prosecution in the UK? Because there are still firms that are advertising and are, are quite blatant in the space, putting up YouTube videos where they're, they're clearly in London doing them and things like that. And nobody has been been uh, in a position to take these forward. I can't take a, a prosecution forward personally. I'm definitely not um, anyone with a legal background. So I had um, didn't have a huge amount of input into the legal sense, but other people who did, who are much more involved with that. So I, 
I think definitely something that we have to do and we have to keep improving on, but I don't think it's a it's a solution. Um, what do you think, Irene? Well, I, I'll start by saying I think that, that any civilised country should not be happy about having playing a host and, and, and providing a haven for, for these kind of services that, that actually inc are encouraging our students to not to do the work themselves, uh, to, to teach in different ways. And, and I think, if nothing else, that's a very good reason for having legislation is, is to, you know, not to encourage um, these companies to set up in, in, in as, as legitimate companies as they were um, um, in, in, in England. And hopefully, eventually, the law will be extended to the, to the other um, UK, uh, parts of the UK. So that's the first thing I think that that, that is worth saying. Um, and I think, it, as you said at the beginning, it's, a, it's, it's important that now we can have a sensible conversation with students, that there's a very good reason why why these companies have been um, made illegal. And incidentally, the, the, the legislation um, doesn't intend to target um, friends and families and other students, um, but, but if, if they, they are actually operating as a company, then they will come under the law. So I think that's how it's going to work. And as you say, I'm, I'm the same, I'm not legally qualified, but, but the, the legislation as it's been framed in, um, in England isn't quite right. I think the legislation, nothing wrong with the legislation, but there is no way of implementing it um, in a sensible way at the moment. So that needs to be done, that needs to be added on. In Ireland, what they did was they put the QQI, the you know, uh, qualifications and quality and qualifications Ireland, the, the kind of quality body, the regulator, was put in charge of dealing with all the all the cases. And, um, and they've particularly been talking to the, the um, um, Sue and various people from QQI. They've been pursuing advertising, really, rather than the companies themselves. And I think that is that is a quite a, 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 an important use of legislation. Um, and I think it will be a while before we get any any um, uh, convictions or you know any any kind of. Uh, um, cases going forward um, because uh, they haven't actually got a central um, body that's going to kind of coordinate cases. So the way it works at the moment is that if we find a case in Coventry, um, all the cases will come into, into an, a mailbox that I've set up. They'll come into my integrity threats mailbox. And then I will look at where the company's based, if they're UK based or overseas, and then I'll talk to the legal services department and, and we'll decide what to do. And what we'll do initially probably is just do a cease and desist notice, whether it matter where they are, but the wording will be different if they're in the UK because they will be told you are, you are breaching UK legislation and, and unless you stop what you're doing, um, we will pass this, this to, the, to the police. But then I have to take this case to the Coventry police station knock on the door and say, you know, here we have a, an SA mill that's operating in wherever they are. It could be Birmingham, it could be Nottingham, it could be London. They're not going to be interested in taking a prosecution from, from the Coventry police station. No, we're, they're going to say we're far too busy catching burglars and, and murderers and, you know, to deal with that. So they won't take it seriously. And they've already, we've already had a conversation with them about that. So it needs to be coordinated by a central body that that's my view and hopefully that will happen eventually so we have a we have a little problem at the moment because it's not strictly helpful in terms of prosecuting but hopefully eventually uh, that will be done so and and thomas and i are, are both part of the fia advisory group and we're actually meeting next week so i, I hope we'll have some conversations then about that and that we can start to move forward on that and, um because it's not for thomas or i to to move on that is it's for a much more kind of high level body to to have those conversations with the government about that to provide the funding and so on um, but in some countries like ireland they've had much more success in australia new zealand have actually brought at least one case i think so there have been odd cases um, that have come forward and been successful um, and, and hopefully if more countries can bring legislation for all the reasons we've talked about and that's going to help help matters uh, but as, as Thomas said, it's not the it's not the solution. It's not the only solution. It's just part of the solution. It's part of the answer. But we all need to keep on working 
Um, and since we've been doing these campaigns, and particularly the International Day of Action has been a really powerful um, um, body for, you know, a, a event for, uh, for raising the awareness. Since we've been doing this, I think we, we have succeeded in raising awareness all over the world. I think there is much more awareness now than there used to be of the, of the, the threats from integrity, uh, from, sorry, to integrity from, from contract cheating. Um, so I think it's actually serving its purpose. Um, and we need to keep on pushing on it. But, but I don't see that the, the number of, of um, SA mills is going down. I, I, I've got no evidence of that. And I know, Thomas, you've worked a lot more looking. That's, you know, your, your, um, your own um, kind of research is very much looking at what SA mills are doing. And I don't know whether you've seen any reduction in the number of SA mills and their activities. I've certainly not seen a reduction in the number of students using them, um, quite the opposite, but maybe it's because we're getting better at catching it now. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, interesting question. And just for people watching this, Irene's role is very much at the top level, academic integrity at Coventry, and have a very good overview and leadership role in the whole process. So it's much more involved with policy development. I still work within a computing department, so I don't have that role within my own institution directly involved. So a lot of these legal type questions wouldn't wouldn't come to me in any form. But uh, I'm just going to pick up on something in the chat as well. It's only been posted to hosts and panelists, but um, essentially, I think this is criminal cases wouldn't be pursued under criminal law. The CPS wouldn't proceed under a civil law. It'd be a personal challenge whereby the SA mill could wind itself up just like a dodgy builder. So yeah. I let people take that one in. I think I get the gist of it, but um, it, this is all these challenges with law and then law differs from country to country as well for that. But so, so yeah, so I mean, so your question really was about how many contract cheating providers or SA mills are there? And some people have tried to, to get numbers. I have never tried myself. And the main reason I've never tried is because the same provider will often operate with 20 different names. They, they might operate with a, a, a version of them aimed just at nurses or aimed just at uh, lawyers in training or whatever it might be, or they might operate aimed at different countries, which essentially is the same service, but they just have a different looking flag on the front page and they have a code at UK domain as opposed to a EU domain for Australia, if they get around the legislation there or whatever it might be. So it's, it's very hard to estimate. I'm still seeing a huge amount of visibility uh, some of the trends I've seen in recent years, though, have been things like uh, alternative ways of advertising. So I, I've looked at some studies, including with students, perhaps we'll get to that topic later on, looking, for instance, at services advertising on Reddit. Uh, and the so often direct adverts from an individual writer which can go out to lots of students through that free advertising channel and very anonymous, moving this discussion to Discord. Also, students directly posting their requests on various sites for other people to jump in and say, I will do the work for you. So not everything goes through the SAML front end. So I think everything is there. Uh, I haven't, because it, I sort of, I know it's there and because I know there are other emerging problems as well in the academic integrity space. I haven't spent so much time directly looking at the individual sites as, as I used to, but I know that every time if I go and give a talk at a particular university and I quite often decide I'd like a local example for a talk, I can very quickly go onto one of many places I know, including classified sites as well, and just look for a university name or a city name or something else that's distinctive and find adverts relating to uh, that university. So everything is very much still there. And I mean, what about you, Irene, from the top level? Have you seen any changes in the, um, uh, sort of in the number of cases that are coming to you or anything well, like that? It, it's, it's an interesting question. I wish I could answer it directly, but unfortunately until recently when I've, I've kind of taken this new role on, 
the statistics that we've been uh, collecting, have, we've, we've not been analysing them in sufficient detail to be able to tell. And the way people are recording cases, originally people were recording cases of contract cheating as, as plagiarism. You know, and, and then others recorded them differently. So we've not had a consistent way of recording the cases. But last year, at last year's data, I actually went in and and um, and tried to do the analysis, you know, in, in much more detail, uh, so that I got some kind of um, grasp of what was going on. Um, and and I'm certainly seeing um, quite a lot of cases coming through in certain parts of the university, in certain subject areas, and in other areas, isn't there are no cases at all. But when I've actually gone in and, and queried, uh, some parts of the university are saying they're still having difficulty producing the evidence um, to sufficient quality to be able to, to, um, to uphold the case against the student, even though they're very convinced that's what the student was doing. So it's actually training those involved in, in um, hearing the cases and, and, and uh, bringing the allegations so that we can then improve the, uh, the quality of the evidence. Um, and actually, we're going to run some training on exactly that very soon in the next few weeks. So we're going to run some training on on producing, uh, bringing a case and producing the evidence and how you can get the evidence. But we're also going to be running training on presenting a case and how you uh, and how you can improve that to try and um, 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 you know help help people to to better present the cases um, so that we so that when when there are genuine cases, we can. We can actually um, convince the panel that, that, that they are uh, they are genuine, uh, but there's also requirement to train the panelists as well, because you never get 100 percent. Well, but rarely get 100 percent certain cases uh, unless the student actually confesses. Um, so so yes, we should be able to have some kind of measure of um, of the cases coming through in the future, but we've not been able to do that. Um, we're improving the quality of the data that we collect so that we've, we've got much more idea of trends and, and what's happening and particular, particularly things like repeat, repeat cases where a student continually um, does something, you know, it might not be the, exactly the same, um, the same behaviour, but uh, um, we're trying to reduce the number of, of, of cases through educating the student when they come through the process, so they have to do a compulsory workshop um, and, and, and quite often a student if they've done that they will have much better idea of what they've done wrong and, and why they shouldn't do it again so that that does appear to be to be having some impact but that brings me on to the next kind of topic that we that we're talking about because it's it's not just about the threats from contract cheating now um, there are new threats aren't there that we're both aware of and I know you've Thomas have been doing quite a few uh, webinars on this topic and you've been looking into this topic um, and, and I've been I'm, I'm leading a, a consultation in my own institution about the um, and it's difficult to to find the term to describe it, but it's student use of uh, of software tools generally that are that contain uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence. And it's, it's those kind of tools, isn't it, that actually are the new threat to integrity. And certainly the way we're dealing with it in my own institution is we are, um, we, first of all, we've done a little bit of research and we've actually brought Thomas in to, to talk to our working group and, and also our, um, um, our other friend, Robin, Robin Crockett from Northampton. You both came in and talked to my working group about this uh, to help to, to set the scene for what, what, it, what the threats are. And... Uh, and we're now going into the next stage where we're going to run some focus groups across the university to consult with staff to do two things, to brief them on what we found out, but then also to collect views and ideas of which of these tools are useful and, and, and under what circumstances and which tools should be banned. Um, and then we'll produce some guidance and, and potentially also um, tweak the regulations so that they, they, they cover any circumstances that we um, that we come across but uh, I've been very vague about what I mean by these tools perhaps Thomas you'd like to come in now and just say what you found out and what what kind of tools you've been looking at and, and what they what their potential is for both as threats for the the um, institutions um, but also other uses for the tools uh, yeah thanks Irene 
I just don't know where to start with this one. <laughs> and uh, by the way, the, the, the questions in the chat, by the way, feel free to chat amongst yourselves if you want. We'll probably we all come back to those because there's a very interesting one in there. But as as we're thinking a bit about artificial intelligence, which perhaps is the wording that we've just completely missed in the introduction to this, uh, this section of our conversation. And, and being a computer scientist, I'm automatically interested in AI as in artificial intelligence because my students are interested in it. And it's one of the things that we're using quite automatically. I can see we have the option of subtitles during this conversation and somewhere there is artificial intelligence which is generating these live subtitles and a live transcript for people who want to review this. I'm sure you can turn that on somewhere in the settings for that, but the kind of technology which a few years ago we would have relied on a person doing subtitling, at least with any degree of accuracy, but hopefully now there, this is clear enough that people could follow this conversation with your sound off and um, and tell what was going on just from the subtitles and we can reuse this information. So artificial intelligence is one of these things that is just part and parcel of everyday lives for that. The problem comes that uh, we're living in a world where AI has to get better. We're depending on it for the efficiency of our workforce. We are uh, preparing students to work in a world where we have AI tools to support them. But we then have a bit of a uh, an impasse that if students are using the tools that they could use legitimately in the workplace to complete their assessed work, then they're um, not necessarily completing the assignments as we originally intended them to be. And so this is really could be considered a bit of an offshoot of contract cheating. But what you can do is you can generate original text using AI tools, which you can then uh, perhaps do some light editing and some changes, but hand in as an assessment. And if the idea of the assessment was you would learn something, and hand in the results of that learning and document it yourself, you've managed to bypass that whole learning process. And so this is the challenge with things, we'll call them, for instance, essay bots or automatic writing technologies, all kinds of different wording out there, are very powerful. And I don't want to go into a big discussion about AI and machine learning and how it all works, because that will, probably bore everyone completely stupid, but essentially uh, there are large models. Perhaps the most famous one is one called GPT-3, released by a company called OpenAI. It's a commercial model, has uh, be, been trained on thousands and thousands of words of English language and other languages. And so it has learned the patterns of words and how to recreate text in a similar format with uh, perhaps similar meaning but not using the identical word sequences. So if we run this text through Turnitin, we don't very often get an exact match when it's generated. And uh, if anyone follows me on Twitter, I occasionally post some of the things that I've been experimenting with and working on. And um, there is a, a webinar I gave a month or so ago for the European Network of Academic Integrity, which is up on uh, their YouTube channel as well about this. But you can see the quality of the text for that that is generated, it's um, it's not brilliant, but in my mind, it's quite often just as good as a student would get by paying a contract cheater provider who is trying to turn out three or four essays a day because they're paid by the word. And so it isn't always um, going to raise that much suspicion there. So we have this concerning situation that most universities are completely unaware of. Uh, now, as well as generating text, you can, if you're a computer scientist like me, you can go straight to the underlying model, the underlying data, and do some really useful things with it. But you don't need a great deal of sophistication because there are services that now package this up in an easy to use form for, um, let's say, for students, but for anyone who wants to generate text as part of this process. So we're seeing the, the generation of text. You can also see the generation of computer programming of source code there. 
almost quite surprisingly, I just talked about this model for generating text. The same model can also be used for generating source code. And that almost came about as a surprise because when this model was learning how to deal with text, it must have just had lots of examples of source code in the data set there. And then the other bit, which is the one that, um, I mean, I find most fascinating in many ways is generating digital images. Some people would call these art. Some people would call these the equivalent to things like fake photographs. You can get very realistic looking human faces of people who don't exist there. You can get people in situations you wouldn't expect. Um, I have also with my computer science um, hat on, I've, I've sort of amended one of the models so it can generate pictures of me or at least which look vaguely like me and, and capture the essence of me. Particularly if I want a cartoon rather than a photo, I can get something that's quite a good caricature or very reminiscent there. I, I can't do Irene because it would take um, me running various things for about an hour and getting quite a no decent number of photos of you, but it would be would be quite possible. And I want to think of because we're all probably in here a bit interested in ethics as well, about the ethical challenges of this type of technology and think about how this can be used for such things as to spread misinformation for fake news can be used for conspiracy theories and so there's some quite dangerous technology which in many ways fascinates me that it's there but in many other ways means we have to reconsider a lot of our um, how we teach students how we prepare them for the future as well how we prepare them for their jobs that might use this technology and the type of assessments that we think are, are useful yeah. So, Irene, I know you've been, um, as you say, you've been sort of leading some work at Coventry about this as well. And I mean, I did meet with with your colleagues in the working group earlier in this in the year, but this has moved on so quickly, even since that time period. But am I right in thinking now that you've started to see work from students produced using AI tools? Yes, interestingly, uh, we we had um because we we didn't one of the things we want to do in terms of the guidance is provide guidance for for staff on how to detect it um and and how you know what kind of characteristics generated uh, work will will have um and 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 there was a case came up um um last week um which i can tell i'll tell you about in a minute but before i say that the, the, the there are more there are less innocuous tools than than um than essay box because we are we're also looking at um, the kind of grey areas of when you would allow a student to use paraphrasing tools, for example. You know, under what circumstances would that would that be appropriate? When would you allow a student to to use translation tools? Uh, because this is all AI type type um, uh, software, and um, because the the quality of the work the the the, um, the outputs from these tools. Is, has uh, improved dramatically in, in, in recent in the last kind of year or so, hasn't it really? So um, you know we used to be able to tell when students had used paraphrasing or translation tools because a lot of the synonyms that they came out with didn't make sense. Um, and to some extent that is still true. You will still get really stupid phrases coming out of, of the uh, of the kind of synonym generation. Um, but they're getting better and they're, they're, you know, they're getting more believable these days. So, you know, but there are characteristics that we that we want to capture that we can provide a little bit like the kind of contract cheating checklist. We'll have a checklist for um, for kind of um, artificial intelligence generated um, um, outputs and things. So it, those kind of things, if anybody wants to work with us on that, it be, it, it, it'll be a really interesting project and uh you know to to actually try and collect some of those those characteristics but you know we, we're aware of some already but you know i'm sure there are the more we look at them the the more we'll find it's things like having no content it's having no kind of real message it's having no critical analysis uh, element to the to the writing um, but we've also come across some where the uh the artificial intelligence realizes it needed a reference, so it completely invented one. Um, you know, so it's not a real reference, or it, or it uses a reference that's only tangentially associated with what, what you're writing. So these are the things things to look for. Um, very rep repetitious. Those are the kind of things things to look for. 
but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you now about the example that we found. So um, we, we didn't actually find it as, a, as a, an example of this at all, because what happened was it was, a, it was very astute of the, of the tutor to find it because it was a very big module with lots and lots of students in, on this module with multiple markers. But there was um, a clue on Turn It In that, that it pointed to another student's work on one of the students' work. And so this uh, tutor did some sleuthing, all manual, and, and got and found there were three students that handed in a very similar piece of work. In this case, you know, we would, I've just answered a question in the chat about the quality of the assessment. In this case, it, it was what, what you would term an authentic assessment because the students have been told to write about a, a bit of um, a practice that they've done um, in terms of, um, of their, their, you know, their, their, it was a workplace um, piece of um, experience from the workplace. But they'd all handed in the same piece of work with slight differences in it, but more or less the same piece of work. And this chap did it, color coded the, the three pieces of work on the same on the same page so that you could see the similarities on them. So it came in as a case of collusion. And the only reason we know it wasn't that it, that it was um, an essay bot is that one of the students uh, at the end of the, the kind of conversations um, in the in the hearing um, uh, said, well, I, I use something I normally use Grammarly but I actually went in and used Quillbot um, and this time. So maybe that was what the problem was. So she'd used Quillbot, which is a, it, it, it does paraphrase, but it also is an essay bot. So, um, and, and I think in this case, we haven't got to the bottom of whether they, whether Quillbot actually generated all the text or whether, or whether um, one of the students wrote it and then they used paraphrasing to make them slightly different. Um, because it was difficult to get either of the other students to tell us anything about what they'd done. So, but so that case came up, um, and uh, you know, uh, um, very interesting. Uh, so we're running out of time now. We've got about five minutes left, I think. Now, so um, do you want to have a look at perhaps some questions in the in the yeah, chat? Yeah, I mean, a few things I'd like just to quickly pick up on because it's amazing how quickly this time runs. Absolutely, because we only allowed for forty-five minutes for this. So yeah. Before the next, so, so you get a break before the next session. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's interesting because Mary, who I think is leading the next session anyway at three o'clock, posted in about students citing custom writing sites in their work there. And a lot of this is just what you said about sites like Quillbot, which are presenting themselves to students as being relatively legitimate. So a student has a reason to, to use them. I, for instance, have, have seen examples of uh, uh, services which are now releasing textbooks on how to write essays, but you can see the branding is from a, an essay mill, uh, or they're offering services to help you to uh, create um, citations correctly by putting in the details, but of course you're then giving your information available to be marketed to. And we're going to see much more of um, the, the border between legitimate and illegitimate services that border get fuzzier, particularly with things like either paraphrasing tools or AI writing tools, when we have things like Word and add some of that technology to help you to improve your sentence structure as you write, which is like the next generation of grammar checkers. So we have to just, just be aware of these things as well, that they're changing there. Um, I mean, there's a comment which only came to host some panelists as well about AI tools are going to be used a lot for the creative industries and marketing and universities behind the curve on this. Yeah, I mean, very much so. I've started to use some AI generated graphics in some of my presentations when I can't find a graphic that is quite how I want. And I know I'm not going to accidentally be taking copyrighted work. But at the same time, for artists, a lot of what we need to teach artists is going to be how to work with this technology that you can still use this as a basis, you can use this perhaps for idea generation, but um, not to replace human generated art, which is always going to have value. But it does mean that some previous skills are going to be devalued there as well. So that's just a couple of things that I'd like to, um, to pick up on and a few more uh, comments about law, which I think that'd be worth a whole chat in its own right, but with some slightly different participants involved. Yeah. yeah. Yes, um, certainly, certainly 
experts on law would you know we should we should have Michael here if we were going to have a conversation on law he he'd, uh, he could easily fill an hour on his own yeah um, yes he could but he wouldn't need either of us and that's Professor <laughs> Michael Draper who we both think very highly of but being from a law background knows how to fill a conversation and, and also he, he he was involved in um in framing the the uk legislation so he's uh you know he, he knows quite a lot about how it was designed to work and so on but um yeah so that that conversation about the world of work and so is really important isn't it and that but that's also about why we can't just ban these tools because they are actually useful and it was the english um english for academic purposes people that came and said don't ban translation tools don't ban paraphrasing tools they actually do help in the right context they helped to um, um, help students to learn how to write um, English but they need to be be um, used in a kind of controlled way rather than just just used for for um, for everything so uh, and, and what we wouldn't want to happen is is a it, and this we know students do this is for say a Chinese student to write in Chinese and then just translate it into English because they're getting an English language degree which which says I have I have done my work in English therefore I'm proficient in English um, and and that's sort of um, that's negating those, that that message about their English qualification so it, it's really important that these that these uh, tools are used in the right way in the right context but we don't want to ban them all together but we need to find out what the exceptions are and when they should be used. So I think we've got about two or three minutes left. So um, I'm going to um, hand back to Thomas to sum up from his point of view. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, we've got so many topics we're both involved with that we could talk about here. Yeah, because we haven't talked um, about students, have we? We're going to talk about working with students. and We, we haven't had time for that. Oh, so. we, we, we had a few topics. We actually had some extra ones we hadn't thought about that came up, but that just, just tells you a lot. But yeah, one thing that we were going to just talk about is uh, how important students are in this process. Uh, I've started working with a lot of student partners to both on research studies and to create resources there and particularly I mean, in computer science get people who can develop software that I can't develop I supervise student projects as well which develop software I'm very much hoping this coming year our final year students are currently solving their uh, choosing their projects that one of them will choose the topic I have which is about detecting AI generated uh, writing so I'll wait and see what the updates are on that one but students can do so much with and we've already seen in some of the other activity including this morning session including the escape room session there about how students are being very much engaged in this process and how we're very much appreciative of everything our students do there um yeah i mean irene any any quick thoughts about our students yeah i i I always value working with students and, um, and on, on everything I do, I always consult students and make sure students are, are co-creators and in, involved in the process if possible. So I, I encourage everyone. I'm, I'm sure most of people, most, most of the people in this call normally do that anyway, because in some ways we're preaching to the converted in these kind of talks, because people that engage with, with these webinars are generally people who are switched on to know what the problems are but I, I'd just like to thank everybody for uh, for all the really fantastic questions sorry if we missed any that we we didn't kind of respond to um but uh, I always enjoy talking to Thomas and I hope we have I hope you've enjoyed listening to us and thanks to the ICAI for uh, for hosting these these webinars and for for organizing the day it's been good yeah thanks Irene I mean this is just like the conversations we have normally the only difference is the uh, there was probably less of a bar involved in in, in the the in-person conversation but hopefully you found something useful the recording of this will be available on YouTube and do come back at 3 p.m about 15 minutes UK time when we've got uh, Mary Davis from Oxford Brooks is leading a round table discussion with both faculty and students about a lot of the activity going around the world and I can see several of the participants here attending so hopefully you enjoy that because there's so much great work going on around the world that we just don't hear about and this is the opportunity so so thanks so much everyone okay bye then